I mean, yeah, they're going to also try to attack Bitcoin's fungibility and, and they will ensure that any kind of licensed, um, or it's likely that um, certain governments will ensure that like licensed businesses won't be able to accept coins that like tick certain red flags. And like um, having worked in cross-border payments for quite a long time, and then also like, you know, KCoin with an exchange, um, you kind of come into contact with uh, a lot of these um, uh, regulations and um, like compliance is a massive headache because you're basically deputized by the government to become an enforcer. You, you become one of their agents in terms of like enforcing whatever crazy policies that they decide and it gets in the way of doing business. Um, it's also a lot of hassle, but also there's kind of like moral and ethical implications there because um, you may be kind of enforcing things that um, or it's very likely that you're enforcing things that like restrict people from using um, the financial system. So like if somebody comes from a specific country, regardless of their background, regardless of their history, like how good a person they are, maybe they're now living in another country. If they come from like a certain country, immediate like red flag, they can't use your cross-border payment service. And it's like um, certainly in those kind of scenarios, if for instance, um, a very large country totally blocked and banned um, Bitcoin connections, um, it would be possible to still operate a Bitcoin node in a kind of um, disaster scenario um, using a blockstream satellite node. So yeah, it definitely helps. And then with the addition of local mesh and um, uh, 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 GoTenor and various other, um, um, like for example, ham radio, you can really start to construct a, um, um, an alternative network that doesn't rely on any internet. How are you all doing? This is Kevin Davani. I'm the host of the Talk Bitcoin Podcast Show. Really excited to have Neil Woodfine, the marketing director of Blockstream, back on my show. I've seen him uh, last time in uh, Vietnam on a Bitcoin conference. So he's got really fascinating insights and you know opinions and perspectives, comprehension of what's going on. So we're going to talk about a, you know a range of topics. We're going to talk about Russia, Spain, the, the Financial a Action Task Force. We're going to talk about Europol. We're going to talk about central bank digital currencies, starting China, you know, handing out uh, digital, uh, centralized digital bank currencies. And also we're going to talk about uh, European central banks. The, we're going to talk about, um, you know the the clampdown and the war that's been staged uh, and 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 waged uh, by governments regulators on Bitcoin privacy and Bitcoin self custody. So yeah, don't forget to subscribe to my channel, please. Um, and if you loved our episode afterwards, let me know your question. My email address is hello at the totalconnect.com. Please uh, leave leave a positive five star review if you loved. If you loved it and don't forget please to do, do subscribe on my different you know podcast platforms and on my youtube channel uh follow me on twitter linkedin facebook telegram what have you so thank you so much again for your support and here you go hey welcome to the total bitcoin podcast show my name is kevan davani my very special guest back again on my show is neil woodfine the marketing director of blockstream Neil, how are you doing? It's been a long time since we haven't heard one or another. <laughs> Hi, Kevin. Nice to nice to see you as well. Um, it's good to be on the show again. Um, I think we saw each other earlier in the year, just before all the Corona stuff um, started kicking off in Vietnam. In Vietnam, so, exactly. yeah, yeah, that was that was that, that was good. That was good timing. Yeah, it was a fun time. So, Neil, I'm I'm really curious because you know you. You have such a such you know critical insights or, or and comprehension of what's going on uh, <clears throat> around the world, and I mean the officially an pre-announced topic of this of this episode is the, the 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 sort of the the waging of the war by uh, by governments and regulators around the world against uh, or on uh, Bitcoin privacy and uh, Bitcoin you know self custody. But, um, you know, it seems there is a much, much bigger picture going on. And I would like to take, uh, you know, have listen to your position, to your you know views and perception, what's going on. Because when I see, um, 
and, and reading all this stuff about, you know, the central bank digital currency in China, people are now seemingly begging for, you know, for a handout, uh, the, the World Economic Forum conflating COVID-19 with, with climate change, also known as so-called uh, global warming, you know, this whole leftist, um, uh, well, what what can I call it? I mean, I'm just going to call it as it is. It's uh, it's we're going into this fascist dictatorial, uh, uh, you know, system where it seems everything that's going on also uh, because of this you know hyper um, propagated uh, COVID nineteen thing um, from Austria where I'm living. You know, with all the uh, you know, with all the measures that have taken, with it be masks, wearing or lockdowns, whatever. What is your perception right now? I mean, in terms of um, where are we going? In, uh, you know, when it comes to the, to the direction of where are we going? So um, obviously, um, I've been beating the drum since like February, March, about kind of uh, the exaggeration of the threat from. Um, coronavirus or COVID or whatever you want to call it. Um, and I expected a lot of kind of dangerous policies to be implemented, but I, I think I never imagined how long they would go on for and like the lengths that they would be taken to. So I think like my biggest takeaway from this is that like in a Bitcoin context, um, it's very difficult to predict how things will turn out and how things will unfold in the future. Um, there's a lot of potential futures that we can't even imagine can happen, but can happen um, if if certain people get their way. So like, um, I, I'm, I'm from the UK um, and I think the UK has been one of the worst in terms of the controls on the population. Um, the worst with like lockdowns and mask mandates and kind of changing the rules on a, on a weekly and even daily basis sometimes, um, which kind of keeps everybody second guessing and unable to plan. Um, so like, I, yeah, I have a, a pretty negative, but pessimistic view of the way things are, um, are going. Um, I mean, Australia is worse, but like, I can't think of many other places that are worse than, worse than the UK. Now I'm based in Asia. Um, so I have like kind of a more international perspective with how, various different regions are handling the disease. And um, for example, where I am in Thailand, it was taken seriously very late and it was only taken seriously for about a month. Um, and during that period, uh, like businesses were closed, but people could still go out. Like they weren't like told to stay at home aside from a 10 p.m. curfew, which obviously doesn't make any sense, but fine, there's like a 10 p.m. curfew compared to other regions, that's like, I'll take that. Um, but like outside of that month, both before and after, um, just everything's been super relaxed. I mean, people are, are forced to wear masks in air conditioned locations like malls and 7-Elevens. Um, but even that is pretty much only strictly enforced in Bangkok. In Chiang Mai, it's, it's been extremely relaxed. And there isn't any like, mass deaths or, or like crazy like bursts and cases um, and like anywhere we look around the world that hasn't locked down they're also totally fine um, so like uh, maybe like this threat of kind of government lockdowns and clampdowns and stuff only applies to um, uh, kind of developed um, western european countries um, and maybe parts of the USA, like maybe we don't have to worry, like maybe there are going to be lots of other places that we can move to, to kind of escape some of the worst um, policies being implemented. But um, yeah, that, that, that remains remains to be seen. There's also like um, potential downsides of, of living in places like um, Thailand or elsewhere. I mean, like, for example, I've got friends in Taiwan um, also um, uh, living very relaxed lives. I don't think like Taiwan ever did any serious kind of lockdowns. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, freedom still is existing in certain places. And, um, like, uh, I think people in the UK and, and elsewhere in Europe probably need to recognize that fact as well. 
but yeah, it, I mean, like just to, to, to round up, like to summarize, in, in the Bitcoin context, it's very concerning because basically anything is possible. Any kind of policies that you can imagine could um, um, get implemented and be directed towards uh, individual investors and also um, Bitcoin industry companies too. Have you read this uh, Twitter thread of Jake Shervinsky, you know, this lawyer um, who's, who, who does really some outstanding, uh, you know, analysis of, of, of the legal or regulatory situation uh, beginning in the United States. Did you read that? I mean, what's, what's your perspective on, uh, on the regulatory? Um, so I, I did read Shervinsky's, um, uh, it's the first time I've heard of him actually. Um, mm -hmm. His thread kind of blew up. Uh, uh, so, I mean, I'm following him now, but, um, uh, it was a really good thread. Um, I think it's good to kind of tie a lot of these dots together. Um, there are a lot of kind of actions being taken against Bitcoin companies and individual investors. I think like his tweet thread didn't even cover everything that's out there. So like recently, uh, for example, you've got um, Russia demanding to see, um, uh, demanding all cryptocurrency investors declare their holdings to the government and um, Spain just in the last few days um, did the same. Um, you also had the FATF, um, Finan Financial Action Task Force, um, um, publish a piece about the, the risks of cryptocurrencies. And in there, they were talking about um, uh, things that will be red flags and included in those red flags are um, using a hardware wallet, which is essentially them saying that self-custody or at least secure self-custody is, um, uh, is a red flag to them. Uh, there are a few other things. Um, uh, Europol, um, we're also prioritizing um, uh, privacy wallets. So Europol are now going to be targeting um, priv uh, Bitcoin privacy wallets um, as, a, a, as, a, as a priority. So um, uh, like, it seems that there's definitely a lot of action being taken around the world. I think my, I would lean towards the, the, the idea that it's not coordinated yet. Um, I think I've, all the various different countries and um, authorities are coming around to the fact that Bitcoin is not going away. It dumped to 3K and now it's back up at 10, 11K. There's a number of like very high profile companies investing in it. Um, I think they're realizing that like this thing's here to stay and they need to start taking um, action. And I, I don't think the way they're going about that is stupid. Like. Um, as a Bitcoin, I think ultimately their efforts will fail and they don't make sense in the kind of, now that this Bitcoin genie is out of the bottle, like what they're trying will, will not work, but like they can do a lot of um, damage in the meantime. Like there's a lot of individuals that they can target with, with, their, um, with their policies, which will hurt people. But anyway, they are working about it smart. They're not just going in and banning Bitcoin immediately and saying like, Nobody can hold Bitcoin. They, they're taking a gradualist approach. And the um, um, one, for example, demanding that people declare their cryptocurrency holdings. Now, like that to a lot of people may not strike them as particularly concerning. It's like, okay, I've still got my Bitcoin. I've still got my cryptocurrencies. Um, like the government knows that I haven't, but like, I still haven't. Like they might tax me later or something. Like it's not a, a big problem. But once they know everything about your cryptocurrency holdings, they put you in a very vulnerable position because um, uh, they can start making demands um, that are very, very difficult to refuse. And um, like, as everybody knows, Bitcoin privacy is pretty terrible um, on chain. So um, once they have all of your UTXOs, for instance, um, it would be very difficult to um, do anything with your Bitcoin um, if like the government turns tyrannical, for, for instance. So, um, and then another thing, Another trend um, uh, uh, that Shavinsky um, pointed out was this kind of attack on custody. And that again is pretty smart. Like that's the way you should go about it. Like if you eliminate Bitcoiners ability to self custody, like all of a sudden they're completely in your hands and you can do whatever you want with them. You can implement whatever kind of crazy tax policies or censorship that you want. So like, but they can do it in such a way where they don't like kind of trigger any alarm bells or like it doesn't look particularly unethical or immoral. They, they're like, we're not taking anybody's Bitcoin. We're just asking for addresses. 
Well, what's wrong with that? And later they'll be like, okay, we're just demanding people put them into licensed custodians. Like everybody has to hold their Bitcoin in a licensed custodian. Um, what's wrong with that? They still got their Bitcoin, they're still theirs. And then it's just like a, pro a progression where they kind of slowly um, erode um, Bitcoin as uh, sovereignty and their wealth and, and, and stuff like that. So I think everybody needs to pay attention to the developments and they're not going to happen the same all around the world. Um, people either need to stay at home and like drive policy changes, which I think is very difficult considering the, uh, the, the, the opponent they're up against. Um, start moving to um, alternative jurisdictions where they're going to be treated a bit more fairly. Um, but like we've seen with the Corona thing, like if you're in Europe and you want to move to another European country, um, uh, the options for um, places that are not going to get too tyrannical are, are getting pretty slim. It's like the number of places that you can escape to are diminishing pretty quickly. Even like Switzerland is, is now demanding that people inform the government if they're going to have a dinner party. Like if there was anywhere in Europe that you would hope that would be a little bit more kind of freedom focused and like protecting people's liberties, it would be Switzerland. But even that kind of dream is dead. So, um, uh, yeah, I, I think like just all of us need to pay attention to, to, to how things are unfolding. Um, excellent. One of the points that Jake Shavinsky, um, uh, did is he pointed out to sort of he, his conclusion was that there would be literally like, uh, tainted coins, tainted bitcoins and clean bitcoins, like, you know, Let's, let's, okay, let's talk about like a, you know, KYC exchange, a normal KYC exchange, like whatever, like Kraken. And so if you withdraw your Bitcoin from there to, let's say, uh, one of these privacy wallets, you know, let's say, you know, Samurai wallet, and you start coin mixing, whatever, Wasabi, would that be like, that considered uh, tainted, <laughs> criminal, or... Or... Uh, yeah, I, I think like things like that will be increasingly difficult to, will, will be very difficult to enforce. I think like aiming for just forcing people to custody everything, it would probably be um, a more efficient strategy. But um, I mean, yeah, they're going to also try to attack Bitcoin's fungibility and, and they will ensure that any kind of licensed, um, or it's likely that um, certain governments will ensure that like licensed businesses won't be able to accept coins that like tick certain red flags. And like um, having worked in cross-border payments for quite a long time, and then also like, you know, KCoin with an exchange, um, you kind of come into contact with uh, a lot of these um, uh, regulations and um, like compliance is a massive headache because you're basically deputized by the government to become an enforcer. You, you become one of their agents in terms of like enforcing whatever crazy policies that they decide and it gets in the way of doing business. Um, it's also a lot of hassle, but also there's kind of like moral and ethical implications there because um, you may be kind of enforcing things that, um, or it's very likely that you're enforcing things that like restrict people from using um, the financial system. So like if somebody comes from a specific country, regardless of their background, regardless of their history, like how good a person they are, maybe they're now living in another country. If they come from like a certain country, immediate like red flag, they can't use your cross-border payment service. And it's like, um, uh, like what you're doing there as a, a fintech company is like perpetuating these these kind of um, exclusionary systems. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I, it's a big problem. So do you think this is, I mean, um, it's, I mean, it's already, it has become a little bit easier to purchase Bitcoin, you know, from uh, the so-called decentralized, I mean, they are decentralized BISC, you know, such as BISC exchange. Um, do you see that trend? Like, do, do you, do you see the development, like, you know, in a certain direction where people are in, more enticed, motivated to go on, even though maybe it's not that much, or that, you know, that uh, much, you uh, convenient or comp, you know, or, or maybe not, uh, maybe not that user friendly. Um, what about those, those people that, you know, that, that at least, you know, try to get their Bitcoin uh, outside the, the, you know, the KYC um, platforms? 
Yeah, so um, first thing is that people that do those kind of things are exposing themselves to ex uh, um, different types of risks. So if you do everything legally through the existing system, withdraw to your own wallet and declare, declare your assets and, and pay your taxes and stuff like that, that like you are safe from certain threats, but there are risks that come further down the line if Bitcoin becomes more disruptive. There could be some extreme, insane policies that we can't imagine, for like the, the, the corona lockdowns that could be targeted at you. So like, um, that's a risk that um, uh, 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 the, the, the BISC users are, are avoiding. But then they, they now have a new risk that like if governments in their chosen jurisdiction ever find out that they're like not complying um, then and or they're using kind of illegal services um, then that could cause them some problems down the line as well so like uh, people just have to kind of work out what they think the most possible future outcomes are and start preparing for that like uh, <laughs> I feel like there's some kind of cosmic justice involved here like Bitcoin is almost too good to be true like you just buy it you hold it and then you get rich over time very quickly like over a few decades if like the price trend continues right and a lot of people have been made very rich over the past 10 years but like it can't be that easy like if if people are getting wealthy and and and, and um, enjoying the benefits of bitcoin that quickly there needs to be some kind of um, um, uh, downside to it and i think the downsides we're going to start to see over the next the next few years it'll happen probably very quickly especially if the bitcoin price starts to increase so for example in china i kind of witnessed it firsthand in the 2017 bubble um china started implementing all sorts of policies and escalating so first it was like kind of every all the bitcoin exchanges had to implement kyc and aml and then they shut all the exchanges down for a few weeks and then they were back up and then they completely shut the whole thing down. There was all these confusing messages coming out from um, the central government. And, and that was happening while the Bitcoin price was, was rising. So I think if we're going to start seeing kind of the next level of um, policies being implemented across uh, Europe and the US and elsewhere, um, uh, then it'll probably happen during the Bitcoin rally. And it, it like, I mean, if we're getting into price predictions, so yeah, I would um, expect that one major move by at least one major government in the West will probably trigger the next bubble popping. Like, I, personally, I think Bitcoin kind of price action that happens in cycles in, every four years, and I, I think we'll probably in the next couple of years see a big, a big rally, um, and that will probably get popped by some regulation somewhere. Um. Do you see like a development where, you know, I mean, you, you work at Blockstream and uh, uh, and as far as I know, you know, Blockstream is also uh, in the in the in the delivery phase of these uh, satellite um, kits. You know, um, what I'm, I think what I'm trying to ask is that do you think that the privacy um, uh, issues can be resolved with um, with um, internet independent um, Bitcoin transactions and off the grid transactions. So, and and in 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 and, and do you know do, uh, in the course of that, you know, uh, when we have uh, a critical adoption rate and maybe even circular economies more and more, and and you know we were we had been talking also yesterday off off the record about MicroStrategy uh, and other institutions now buying. Uh, vast sums of, of Bitcoin uh, and you don't, I mean, you, you told me that you don't see that, you don't see that positively, I mean, or optimistically as others do, um, that it would sort of, you know, uh, create um, a hyper, a hyper Bitcoinization, not a hyper Bitcoinization, but you know what I mean, like, like a, like a, a process where, um, where, um, these institutions would have a positive impact on 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 the legislative process or on politicians uh, for you know for Bitcoin's adoption. Yeah, uh, so I think there's two questions there. One is about like our blockstream satellite helps in kind of um, um, attack scenarios for Bitcoin, and then the second question is about um, how 
um, there's this idea going around um, that the more um, powerful people and companies invest in Bitcoin, the more resilient it will be against any kind of um, uh, unexpected extreme government actions because you'll have like government officials invested and like powerful companies influencing politicians to stave off the worst. Um, so I'll answer those in reverse order because that probably makes more sense. Um, so I, I am optimistic about uh, MicroStrategy and and um, I can't remember the name of the other company that just invested or at least declared their, their, their investment recently. Having people acknowledge Bitcoin's um, kind of sound money properties, uh, its store of value properties um, is good. Um, people acknowledging the weakness of fiat and converting it into Bitcoin is good. These are all great trends. And like um, what I'm talking about, or what we're talking about today is kind of the, the more kind of paranoid edge case angle, I think. Like if this trend continues, it's definitely good. We've got more people on board, um, great. But like, it's not, um, it's not all kind of um, sun and rainbows. Like the, 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 the companies like MicroStrategy and um, other kind of financial organizations are extremely compliant. Like they're, they're ridiculously compliant. Um, I think they're probably using custodians to store their Bitcoins. So like if there are any kind of um, um, actions taken against Bitcoin, custodians will be the first ones to get targeted. And so they'll get carried along with that. But then also like if, they, if MicroStrategy um, or another company receives orders that like they have to liquidate their Bitcoin holdings or um, uh, pay a gigantic tax or whatever, they, they just absolutely have to comply. Like, and as we've seen, I keep on bringing it back to the um, uh, Corona lockdowns, like the kind of policies that will be demanded of people and companies are completely unexpected. Like these lockdowns are also hurting very large organizations um, as well as small businesses and individuals. And like these large organizations also have influence over, over policy and can't like hold them off. So um, yeah, I think like, we, we have to bear in mind that these very large organizations are less sovereign and um, have less resistance when it comes to anything that starts coming down the line. Also, there may be benefits for them um, in complying to certain regulations. I mean, like, it's not going to be all stick, maybe like carrots. Like, um, uh, uh, if they like choose to comply with certain regulations, they may be allowed to kind of continue holding it and pay less taxes or, um, uh, uh, like they could be co-opted into this new system where like a kind of a fractional reserve Bitcoin, for instance, where they see some of the benefits of that. So like, uh, it's, it's very difficult to, to um, kind of uh, predict how that will unfold. And then like the other question is how does satellite help with this? Um, I mean, satellite primarily is, is more designed for, um, um, creating redundant connections for running your, your uh, Bitcoin node. So if you, um, uh, uh, um, if you, if you're worried about your internet connection dying on you at any point, you would use Blockstream satellite and that would provide you a second connection, which would allow you to maintain your, um, your node. Um, and then, uh, also it's for places that don't have any internet. So you can also run a Bitcoin node in these kind of remote locations, but another kind of key benefit, which is perhaps less lower priority than that, but still exists, is the fact that you can run a Bitcoin node privately. And I think one very obvious strategy that may be employed in, in and like, I don't think I'm kind of breaking any, uh, any kind of tips here, but like would be to start um, demanding um, uh, uh, licenses for uh, Bitcoin node hold, uh, Bitcoin node operators, for instance. Um, and if that happens, like um, it'd be very dangerous for people to run a Bitcoin node they tend to have quite a large footprint on, on a broadband connection. Um, so it's, it, it would be quite easy for um, um, internet service providers to identify who's running Bitcoin nodes. Um, so in that kind of scenario, like running a, um, a blockstream satellite node is, is a really good way of getting around that because um, nobody knows that you're receiving the, the, the Bitcoin blockchain. Like you, you've got your satellite up and you're receiving it totally passively. There's no kind of like signals being transferred on the internet that like declares that you're you're using this technology. You right. have like and, and, hundred you know, people and, in a smaller. 
Exactly, like okay. circumvent, you know, circumventing all these uh, restrictions, uh, surveillance, censorship uh, in all these countries. You know, we've, we've been talking also with with Randy Brito of Lodge Mesh and uh, Richard Myers of Global Mesh uh, Labs. Uh, that's the whole purpose, right? Like in countries like uh, Venezuela, Turkey, Iran, you know, uh, with it be countries with hyperinflation, surveillance, or um, sanctions, you know, so that's the whole point, you know, to circumvent these kind of inhuman uh, restrictions or censorship, surveillance, or... Yeah, I, I wouldn't say that was the, the whole point of blockchain satellite. Um, <laughs> There, there, there are there, there are limits to how far it can be pushed as well. But um, certainly in those kind of scenarios, if, for instance, um, a very large country totally blocked and banned um, Bitcoin connections, um, it would be possible to still operate a Bitcoin node in a kind of um, disaster scenario um, using a blockstream satellite node. So yeah, it definitely helps. And then with the addition of local mesh and um, uh, uh, GoTenor and various other, um, um, like for example, ham radio, you can really start to construct a, um, um, an alternative network that doesn't rely on any internet whatsoever. Yeah, especially with radio. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's what I understood from the talks with Richard Mice and Randy Britt and also yeah. Alessandro Cicero in Venezuela. Very fascinating projects that are going on. Um, so, um, so Neil, I mean, wh where do you, uh, what, uh, do you think we are at the juncture, like, um, you know, macroeconomically, geopolitically, and also, you know, because I'm, I mean, I'm really concerned, to be honest with you, when I look at the development right now, and um, things are going so fast and so simultaneously, that I'm like, are we at the juncture? Are we going into, you know, um, <laughs> total surveillance and uh, communist-like uh, regimes all controlled by the central banks or uh, or we're going you know really into more and more towards freedom and and censorship resistance and 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 uh hardest and scarcest money you know uh, what is what is what is it that you see on the horizon i mean or where are we uh, from your perspective i think uh, for a lot of countries places like the uk it's very obvious that corona will be used to um, um, implement f even further kind of scary policies. Um, like I've got a list of predictions that I put out in March on, on Twitter um, and like half of them have already come true and the other half are, are, are pending but are probably already being discussed. Um, yes, I think like in the short term I'm very pe pessimistic. I think um, uh, governments are getting too big but then also kind of there is a lot of popular support for governments getting bigger, everybody's kind of own pet problem. Um, they're kind of expecting the government to fix that, and that's great news for the government because it means everybody wants them to to, to expand. Um, so I, yeah, I, I think like it, it's it, it's a problem both. I mean, the government is taking far too many um, uh, liberties away, but then also there's a kind of a general problem with um, Western populations where they've got like kind of lazy and, and and their ideology is pretty weak uh, and they, they, they're quite happily giving them away and in many instances demanding that they give them away. So uh, yeah, I think like if you are um, kind of liberty-minded Bitcoiner, um, you need to be prepared for things to get worse in the short term and start preparing for how to make things better. Um, uh, like I think Bitcoin definitely, I mean, people always talk about Bitcoin fixes this, right? And like, and then you've got a number of people that kind of rail against that and like these problems are complex and Bitcoin can't fix like all sorts of political problems. I think that the, the, the main meme of Bitcoin fixes this is that it creates the conditions, it creates the environment in which these problems can get fixed. Um, until we fix the money, like the, 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 the banks and uh, the central governments have way too much power. Like they literally can just throw money at people to make them do things. And um, if they are more constrained by Bitcoin, um, then it makes things more difficult for them. And that kind of puts the wedge in that allows kind of um, um, the more liberty focused people to start kind of um, uh, leveraging that and, and, and um, trying to make a more, more reasonable future. Um, I think like there's a lot of other good technological things happening outside of Bitcoin in terms of like private communications, which like based on the very recent Twitter news is 
it's becoming very clear that uh, that's probably going to be necessary. Until now, we haven't seen ISPs get in in the game, but they seem to be like, I, it hasn't, I haven't heard it discussed yet, but they seem like the obvious next vector to start controlling the conversation. So um, I, I'm kind of expecting they'll be deputized soon. Um, yeah, so I mean, like, <laughs> not a whole lot of kind of positive messages there. Um, and I think, like, in terms of discussing, like, kind of potential strategies, I think it's almost a little bit dangerous to discuss them in public. Um, some of them are like, uh, I mean, one, you don't want to get in trouble, and two, you don't want to give away your hand. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, like, it's difficult. It's, it's difficult. It's, uh, yeah. it's increasingly difficult. Yeah. I, ho hopefully, I think one of, one of the good trends that Bitcoin will hopefully lead to, and perhaps this is happening outside of Bitcoin too, but this decentralization. So, like, the US states, like, regardless of what's happening with Bitcoin, steam, seem to be fracturing, um, mainly along kind of like this polar political lines, but at, at least it seems like, uh, for example, California is particularly like opposed to like somewhere like Texas or North Dakota or something like that. Like um, that's a good trend. And then also in Europe, we're seeing Brexit and then other kind of EU separation movements happening over there. And smaller states aren't necessarily safer states but at least, I mean, it's a bit like the Bitcoin thing, right? It, it creates better conditions for realizing um, um, freedom. So um, that I think is is also something like, that's a positive to be taken from from the way things are going. Yeah, I understand your approach or your, you know, your position. Like, it, I mean, Bitcoin definitely creates the conditions, um, as you said, you know, the environmental conditions, the monetary conditions, the structural conditions. <laughs> to you know, uh, finally uh, make this make this process evolve, you know, into a more uh, liberating, freedom-seeking, uh, and and rational um, uh, world. Um, I mean, I mean, besides you know, educating people, that's what we do. Whether it's podcasts, books, articles, there's like tons of. You know, so even on Twitter, it's the social media itself, it's educational tool. But do you see like the pain point already, even the fragmented, like reaching a point with it's in Western world and Europe or other uh, other places where, you know, there's a wake up call for people, you know? I'll, yeah, I'll... Um, I think like pe people um, get a bit dejected that everybody's so apathetic right now. Um, and they, they, they kind of like, oh, everybody's just going to comply and like, um, uh, like the world is doomed. But I think when you start to see kind of people's livelihoods and wealth getting targeted, you will see ideological shifts. Like when it's not in kind of people's interest, um, people will start to change the way they think. And like whatever kind of the kind of zeitgeist is right now, um, it will change in the future. And it, it's a bit like um, people are like, oh, oh, everybody just wants to store Bitcoin with a custodian. They don't want to look like, I mean, Peter McCormick talking about people don't want to use, don't want to know what an expo is. Like, there are certain things that can take place that will make people very interested in having self custody and very interested in learning what an expo is. Out of and necessity, so, of like, course, right? Out of necessity. Out of the, exactly, out of necessity. Like, if if certain policies are put in place, like you will see people like having motivation to go learn. So, um, uh, yeah, I think like it's really important that Bitcoin exists. One. So it like, gives people that exit, that option to like go and learn about. But then also in addition to like, I mean, you mentioned education, that's great. Like um, there are always can be more resources that can be refined and, and stuff like that. But then also I think there needs to be more products, like um, the more, more products and more companies, the more Bitcoin technology out there, the more resilient the entire system is, the more useful Bitcoin will be to people. Um, uh, yeah, I think like, at the moment, there's not a whole lot of companies in the Bitcoin space. That's true. Not a whole yeah, lot of people building, building, yeah. building stuff. Um, so, like uh, outside of education, I think it's really important that um, people don't just like, oh, I can't do anything. Like, I'll just educate people in Bitcoin. Like, education is important, but then also like people should be trying to find ways of, of building Bitcoin things, like Bitcoin aligned things as well. Yeah, I mean the product development. I mean, I have seen some some ramp up in the product development. Uh, at least, you know, uh, as a as a testing tool or beta phase or, you know, or at least in the developmental stage, uh, whether it's, uh, 
you know, a Spectre, Umbrel, uh, or even yeah. from Unch by Unchained Capital. So there are some some products, some uh, services already offered, which I think is great. But the, I think I still think there is a huge potential with its you know user experience, user interface, a practi practical you know experience by the users through the user. So um, where, where do you see this going? I mean, do you see like a uh, uh, you know, uh, huge niches opening up for for people, average person, Joe and Mary on the street, who who can finally you know start using it, start uh, self custodying themselves without you know being paranoid about the security, the privacy. I don't know. I I think <laughs> we're almost there already, and we have been for a, a few years. Like I, I mean, people complain about the complexity of of, of Bitcoin, but. Um, for example, Trezor just has a fantastic UI. I mean, it's not particularly private, um, but like for um, uh, uh, grandmothers and stuff like that, it's it's usable as it is. Um, like they, they, they will have to sit down and work it out. But I mean, for example, if you're going to purchase a house, um, uh, whether in the US or UK or whatever, like that is a very difficult process. People motivated because they want houses. They're motivated to, to, to go and learn about all of it, like um, uh, getting the loan out and, and, and um, dealing with all the legal hassle that surrounds it. Like people work that out, and it, by comparison, um, setting up a treasure, for instance, is is much much more simple. And I think the more people realise the need for holding Bitcoin to put their savings in, um, like the more people will start adopting it, no problem. Um, but then again, like I think Spectre is particularly good because it kind of makes using a Bitcoin full node more. Yeah, um, yeah. it's become more easier. important. You know, this, yeah. this privacy and uh, the you know not not leaking out any kind of information. So it's it's this kind of thing that needs to be edu really people need to be educated about. And I mean, it's a treasure is great, but it's just you know it's it's as a as a what do you call it as a as a you know uh, jumping into the pool for the first time it, that's that's great but uh, once you yeah. know the details uh, <laughs> the, the, the devil you know is in the detail so <laughs> yeah there's also a thing that'll happen like these projects um i mean inspector seems to be like going great a lot of attention so mm -hmm. like they're probably just going to be successful in their own right but there are probably um other smaller projects that don't get a whole lot of attention but are also really cool um that kind of lay the foundation for better projects once there's more um, incentive to use them. So like, I think increasingly in Bitcoin, we're going to see um, a, a split between um, the black market and the white market. Um, uh, like whether you think like in your chosen jurisdiction, like Bitcoin policy is going to develop positively or, or, or negatively, there are going to be places where it develops negatively. And that will create demand for um, black market kind of or products that facilitate um, black market usage. And if there's demand, like people will find ways to market that. And so I think when that happens, you'll see some of these kind of projects really kind of kick into gear and develop very quickly um, to meet to meet right. that, that need. Right. So um, yeah, I mean, I mean what, the more yeah. preparation we can do now, the better. But, um, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, definitely. I agree with you. It's just, um, you know, whatever one thinks about the status of the legitimacy of a nation state government, regulation, regulators, central banks, whatever. Um, I mean, I always say that's uh, the whole point of Bitcoin is uh, whoever was or wh whatever Satoshi Nakamoto was, is that, you know, to take away um, this um, or as uh, Hayek, you know, to, <laughs> Hayek, the, the great Austrian economist who died uh, already, but um, he said that that's the only sly roundabout, um, he, or he, he had been hoping or wishing for a sly roundabout, and that's that's what we have, that's Bitcoin, to take away that thing, which is money out of the hands of governments. And, um, and I think that Bitcoin is the black market money for the totality of humanity. And uh, what, do you, what do you think about this statement of mine? <laughs> Uh, like, yeah, I mean, some people just don't want to um, <laughs> break the law and I think they, they're always going to be around. So, and I think Bitcoin is still useful to them. Um, so like, yeah, I, like as well, I think 
things are going to get hardest during the transition period. I, when we see fiat fail, um, there'll be a lot of popular support for nasty policies and the, 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 the powers that rely on fiat currencies now will probably get pretty nasty too. Uh, but after the transition, like I think we could probably start to see things mend and improve. Um, and at that point, like the, the, the black market will shrink and the white market will, will start to become the kind of the dominant um, uh, set of industries. And in that case, I think Bitcoin, again, is, is still extremely important and valuable. And, um, and at that point, it will be particularly white market. But I think people need to be prepared that like in some places, Bitcoin will be necessary as a kind of black market facilitator. Um, and the black market will save lives. Like people won't be able to eat, for instance, without purchasing their food on the black market. So, um, uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't want to classify Bitcoin as a black market tool. I don't think that's particularly good framing either for like that probably encourages worse action against it. Um, uh, but yes, like if we're going to accept reality, it will be used in black market um, um, uh, purchases. And also like there's going to be a, a wide range of markets between white market and black market like there is today. Um, and Bitcoin will also be particular. Will also be very useful within those. See, yeah. Before we, I want to respect your time, uh, Neil. And uh, before we wrap up, uh, you know, since we're working with other Bitcoiners on uh, different projects now, Bitcoin commercials, uh, trailers, teasers, and also a, a total film production, uh, a documentary, uh, "Humanity Rooted in Bitcoin" is the working title. Do you think uh, we are? Uh, we're going into this phase where there will be more, you know, as, uh, you know, such as projects or um, organizations such as Sea Setting Institute, Ocean Builders, Free Private Cities. I mean, I had some beautiful talk with Jeff Booth and Tito Gable of Free Private Cities. Jeff Booth, you know, the author of The Price of Tomorrow, Why Deflation is the Key to an Abundant Future. I don't know whether you have, you have read it. Uh, do, do, do you have a, have you read it? Can you? I've been, I've been really bad with books this year. I've okay, like gotcha. A, a very long Really, I've seen a lot of people recommending it though. Yeah, you should you should definitely whenever you have some free time, just read it. It's it's really a eye opening. I mean, it was for for a lot of people, also for myself. Um, do you think there'll be more like breakaway societies, breakaway civilizations, free private cities? You know, where we have um, you know deflationary economies, deflationary technologies, entrepreneurs, investors, you know, geniuses coming together, people, you know, citizens coming together and. And and uh, all over the world, and and creating their own, you know, uh, free private cities uh, where uh, Bitcoin embedded, rooted uh, within that, you know, the core structure. Um, do you see this coming, or do you see this evolving more and more? That, I think that one's beyond beyond my expertise. Um, I think but would, um, wouldn't I that be the solution? Would that wouldn't that be like a viable solution for you know getting out of this? It would be nice. Madness? It would be nice, but I would also be um, worried and skeptical about getting into kind of brand new built dedicated cities from kind of crackpot libertarians. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I mean, like there, there would be no precedent for that country, or that region, uh, that society, that culture for, uh, for succeeding. And um, uh, yeah, I'd be like, I mean, there's a few um, options right now, right? You got the, the free state project and um, I just saw one recently in Europe somewhere near, near Kosovo, I think it was, mm -hmm. um, like, uh, there, there, there are already kind of options like that, but, um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think kind of decentralization of existing states is probably a better trend and, um, within those kind of new, um, kind of entities, hopefully kind of, um, more, um, uh, ethical, more freedom focused um, politicians will start to get into power and, and maybe like with um, the kind of uh, the tools um, that with their kind of tools of, uh, of tyranny restricted, um, then hopefully like even if they want to do bad things, it'll become very, very difficult to do that. So, um, uh, yeah, I mean, I can't say whether we'll see lots of like free cities. Hopefully we'll see increasing decentralization, UK oh, breaking okay. off the EU, gotcha. UK fracturing into multiple countries, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, the idea was behind, you know, the, this whole uh, idea was uh, to, to uh, you know, that the services that governments should be bringing uh, could be could be delivered, you know, much more efficiently, cheaper, 
and better uh, in such a, you know, let's say, uh, uh, confined space or uh, free private cities. And we would have, you know, a deflationary economies and, and, and uh, rational, uh, sound money. Uh, so, you know, uh, the, the, I think the average life of a, of a person, of a citizen of such a private, free private cities could, could really uh, profit out of that, you know. Yeah, sounds good. And if, if the rest of the world is, is getting pretty dangerous, then um, there could be uh, great places to escape to. <laughs> um, okay, yeah. good. <laughs> Hope, hopefully we see something like that. All right. Well, Neil, uh, it was really a pleasure to talk to you. It was always uh, enlightening. Um, can you uh, tell my listeners where they can find you or what what's, is there anything on the horizon? That you, uh, anything you want to share? Uh, you can find me on Twitter, um, where I post various friends um, at and would find and that's that's about it for now all right neil was a pleasure thank you so much yeah thanks very much kevin catch you bye later. bye hey what you guys think about this episode i really enjoy talking to neil Woodfine every time he's got you know great uh you know, grounded perspectives uh not too pessimistic not too optimistic but you know he's got a realistic approach so that's what i love about him and um, yeah, let me know your questions. Don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel, to my podcast platforms. If you really liked this episode, please leave a five-star rating, a review on you know on any podcast platform, iTunes, Apple, what have you. So if you have any special you know wish for special content, special guest, let me know. Uh, but please don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel, to my podcast platform. Follow me and Neil would find also on. Twitter, going to put those in the show notes. So um, yeah, uh, been Bitcoin fixes this and that, but we need really, we have uh, still a lot of work to do, not only educational wise, but, you know, creating the infrastructures, creating more user-friendly products, services, and uh, the pain point, you know, is, has also not been reached yet, especially in the Western world, whether it be, you know, Europe or any other, you know, Western countries. Uh, country or continent so uh yeah we have a lot you know work to do and but we can you know if you share this video if you share you know other educational materials to your friends neighbors colleagues family members just you know give them the information and it will you know it needs some time to digest but eventually we'll get there because right now, I mean, as I see it, we're either going, you know, totally into centralized, uh, super surveilled, uh, totalitarian, you know, fascist, uh, communist-like regimes, uh, controlled and uh, uh, and and steered by central banks and governments, or we're going really towards freedom and innovation and to you know, total innovation, abundance, prosperity. So. Let me know your, you know, if you have any wishes for any special content or guests. And thanks so much for your support and for listening. I'll talk to you soon again.